Hi folks, welcome back to the channel, great to have you along again once again. Well today we've got something completely different. Uh, we are going to be looking at this interesting, to say the least, new model from Model Collect in China. Uh, model Collect is a sort of one of these Chinese companies that seems to be uh, making quite interesting subjects and uh, from what we've seen so far we saw the uh, the B2 Spirit Bomber, which was very interesting, <coughs> and many others that they've come out with. And now they've just produced this latest one, which is the V1 Flying Bomb, or Pfizer 103, uh, also known as the Buzz Bomb, or the Doodle Bug. And in this case, they've produced uh, a model where it's going to be a 70 second scale, so it's not huge, but it's on the launch ramp, which is uh, I think is unique. So I haven't opened this, so uh, it's completely new to me. I'm going to, you're going to see me open it and my impressions immediately uh, live, as so to speak. Um, but I thought we'd just talk about the V1 flying bomb uh, and its place in history uh, for a start, really. So, obviously, um, this was developed by the Nazi regime in Germany during World War II. They were, uh, by the middle of the war, start, once the Americans had come in, they realised that they were probably in real trouble. Uh, D-Day, of course, occurred on the 6th of June, 1944. And the sort of mission to try and find a way to strike back at the Allies quickly and effectively, especially against the invasion beaches and against London itself, Britain's capital city, became a real urgency for them. And, of course, the reason that they had to do this, this is basically the world's first flying bomb. It's a, I was going to say it's unguided, but it is guided. They had gyroscopes to actually guide and set its elevators and its rudder at the rear. Uh, but other than that, it was just a glider, really. Um, once the engine had cut, which again was unusual because it was a pulse jet, uh, hence the name Buzz Bomb, because it made this buzzy noise. Blah, 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 blah. Horrendous. I don't think I did justice there, but quite a horrible screaming noise that it made and uh, instilled fear into people you know it was quite a, a new technology um, and it was it was very scary and the reason they had to develop this technology was because they'd lost air superiority of course um, by the middle of sort of 1943 to 44 German raids across to the channel to England were petering out completely really because you've got the the latest versions of the Spitfire the Americans were here with their Mustangs and Thunderbolts the Mosquito was there as a night fighter. It was very difficult for the, the Nazi Luftwaffe to get across to the UK and attack the Americans or the Brits uh, at their bases because they just couldn't get through the defensive screen what with the radar and the fact that there was all these fighters now totally outnumbering them, it made it impossible. So they developed this technology to try and strike back the cruise missile so there was no pilots at risk and they could fire lots and lots of these. And I was reading that in one day, one unit, um, I think it was the one in northern France, actually fired 316 V1s in a single day. So they must have been firing them all day long. So you start to realise that this was quite a threat, you know. Um, I think they built some like 16,000 of them, but very uh, only a small number were actually fired, relatively. But 300 in a day, that's, that's quite a big number, isn't it? Uh, it's a good job all the sites weren't doing that. That would have been terrifying. And of course they had these uh, sites. I, I've been to a couple of them myself. Um, I went to the one at Vizernes, um, the Cou La Coupole, which is actually a V1, V2 site, mainly for V2. But they also had V1 ramps that they were setting up until the Royal Air Force came in with the Lancasters and the Grand Slam bombs and bombed the living daylights out of their dome at La, La Coupole. Uh, and this has now become a, a museum in northern France and I strongly recommend you visit it. If this subject about V weapons interests you at all, and by the way, we'll come on to the others in a moment. I've got the it's a references I'm going to make. You see the I've got the Tamiya V1 here. That's the 48 scale one. We'll talk about that. Um, the other one I saw was at um, well, there's a really good example of a V1 on its launch ramp, and that's at the, the Block House, uh, and that's at a place called Epilec, which is ooh, it's about eight nine miles northwest of the one I've just mentioned, La Coupole. Visons. So it's this northern you know, part of Calais area where the Germans set up all these different sites intending to launch across the channel, right into Belgium and right up the Dutch coast as well. There were sites all over the place and the RAF were doing low level bombing raids with things like the Mosquito on a daily basis trying to knock them out. Anyway, um, I was reading something very interesting about this actually which I had not heard about before and it was about, um, some of you may not know this, uh, some of you probably have heard, 
Uh, agent Garbo was a German uh, Nazi agent who'd been turned by MI6 in the UK and was feeding the Germans false information and of course the British were able to decode all the German uh, message traffic through their system called Ultra uh, and this is, these are the guys that were set up at Bletchley Park uh, the intelligence service headquarters uh, down in Buckinghamshire is it? Uh, so, so it's kind of board of Bedford, Bedfordshire, Buckinghamshire, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire down there. Forgive me, my local uh, geography is not that great, but it's in that little part of uh, England, northwest of London. And of course, they were using the Enigma code machine to, uh, with big Alan Turing, of course, the famous guy who broke the German code, who's working on all of this stuff, and his massive team at Bletchley Park. And uh, so, uh, when I mentioned Ultra, I'm talking about this intelligence uh, system for breaking German code. Um, messages. Anyway, back to Garbo, um, uh, whose real name was Juan Pirol. Uh, he was a um, Spanish guy who was working for the Germans, but I say was, was turned, was actually helping the Brits. Uh, and he was, uh, the, the Germans were trying to find out intelligence about where these bombs, D1 bombs, were landing. And he was feeding them information saying there were, there were a lot of them were falling to the northwest of London. And, there were, and of course this was a quite a random weapon because it wasn't heavily sophisticated in its guidance system, it was quite crude really. So Garbo was telling them that a lot of these um, missiles were firing and hitting targets in northwestern London causing a lot of damage. So the Germans would then think, ah we're overshooting the capital, we need to bring it in a little bit and perhaps uh, change the gyro so it'll drop to perhaps 8 or 10 miles shorter. And of course the true intention being that we would make uh, the Germans drop their missiles short, hopefully missing London altogether, maybe even falling into open country, certainly into less densely populated areas. Um, but I understand that there was, um, uh, they had another agent, I think he was either Norwegian or Finnish, excuse me, and he was feeding more accurate information and they actually started to ignore this counterintelligence and plus it, it was never going to be a very effective counterintelligence campaign simply because the, the, you know, these bombs were dropping on cinemas and all sorts of things uh, and it was in the press, it was in the British press so the Germans could read about where these missiles had fallen and kind of maybe work out exactly where they were going so in some respects you could compromise your agent by giving two false information so this they sort of wound it down and in the end, of course, uh, the problem was eradicated when the Allies, uh, having had their victory in Normandy, they charged across France and a lot of these sites by September. So it was a three-month campaign. It started uh, week after D-Day and carried on until sort of mid-September. And then the Allies captured these launching sites. So that was the end of the, the V-1 flying bomb scourge. Anyway, let's talk about the models. So we've got this new one for Model Collect, but just before we open that and have a look, We've also got just a reminder, because some of you will or will not have seen uh, my earlier review. We had a review on the V2, of course, the, the Vengeance weapon. This is the one I was just alluding to at La Coupole. And uh, this is the Revel kit. I won't go into this again too much detail. But you remember it comes on a little stand with like a little trailer, which is a really nice kit, actually. That. And it's actually, I think it was an ICM kit, if memory served me. Uh, did it say on the side? I can't remember. I am just going to open it because I think I've, I think I've made the wrong one, I'm telling you. Was it ICM? Was somebody else had made this and it was one of the reasons it's so beautiful, I think. Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah, CMK. CMK kits, it says. It's a lovely kit, that. So that is a recommended one. If you're interested in this subject, Germany's Vengeance Weapons, that's one you should definitely consider. For sure. So that's the... Uh, the V2 172 scale. So same scale as the one we have here. And then of course we've got the uh, the Tamiya. This is the uh, the V1 on its little stand which they used to wheel them around on. Uh, trolley I should say, but it's stand. Uh, and it's a really nice kit actually I have to say. Uh, I really enjoy making this. Uh, very simple kit. Uh, pops off like so. Buzz 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 you know. You get the idea don't you. It's a cracky little kit this is, and uh, oh, one thing I forgot to mention with the history, uh, the history lesson, I forgot to say um, prior to the Allies finally conquering these on the ground, of course, the only defence you had against these weapons was uh, shoot them down either with anti-aircraft fire or sending up a fighter plane. 
but it could do 400 miles an hour, so it's really hard to catch. You had to have planes with bases that were kind of along the flight path into London. Uh, so the RAF set up uh, set a couple of Tempest squadrons, uh, and initially they were struggling for numbers because the Tempest they only had 30 available, and eventually they, they increased to about 100. Uh, and the Americans joined in to help as well. They, they actually stripped out some of their P-47 Thunderbolts, apparently removing all the armour plating, specifically for this role. Uh, they uh, they, ha they ha reduced the fuel tank sizes uh, to make the plane lighter and faster. And they sort of had a stripped out hot rod version of the P-47 Thunderbolt to chase these V-1s down, which they did. And of course the sp later Spitfires, that, that could just about catch them and keep up with them. Um, and the Mosquito, and again they use, uh, I think they were generally using the, uh, the Mark VI, I think, Mosquito. And again stripped out, you know, with um, a lightened fuel load to try just to be a a sort of greyhound to catch these very fast little little bombs and of course the two ways you destroy one was obviously shooting it down but it was quite dangerous because it carried what was it a ton of amatol in the nose so when it went off there's, there's some footage you can see from uh, the archives you know on youtube when these things exploded it was a hell of a big bang and it would easily take you down with it if you were close if you're less than about 100 yards away you're in trouble when you hit this because it's a huge explosion and so a lot of them resorted, to the, especially the fighter pilots, um, things like the Spitfire, the Mustang, and Thunderbolt. They would t do this thing where they tip the wing, so they would get they get their I should have brought the plane out, shouldn't I? They'd get their plane uh, alongside, uh, and they would try and tip it because uh, apparently what would happen is when you look at the rear of it, as you are now. If I move that, so I don't get focus trouble. Uh, They'd come along, so imagine my hand here is a Spitfire, and you get you try and tip it. And if you tipped it beyond about 40 45 degrees, it would overcome the gyroscopes uh, that were controlling the, the rudder uh, and the elevator, and it would uh, that would, it would go out of control and it would go into a steep dive and crash down. So it was, but this was risky, you know. You're flying, you've got to be an absolute ace pilot with millimetre precision to be able to do that, to get your wing underneath. Generally, they would go underneath and tip it like that and flick it over. But you, this is not a, not a very healthy occupation and uh, very, very dangerous. Anyway, enough of that, enough of these other models. We will now get into looking at the model collect of the V1. Um, and this was supplied by my friends at PM Models, uh, excellent uh, store and people, as I'm sure you probably, a lot of you probably know already. Um, so it comes in a nice top top opening box, uh, just a plain white underneath. So let's have a look. There's not much on it apart from the basics. Okay, put that over there. See what we have inside. Zoom you in for this. You see what that. Is. So it looks like we've got quite a lot of ramp. Of course, it was um, it worked off as like a steam, um, a steam catapult system, um, like a plug that was uh, launched, very much like an aircraft carrier style system, actually. Uh, so let's have a look. We've got a bag of stuff here. A lot of instructions for it. Now I'm completely new to model collect. Uh, or no, I did see the V V2 Stealth. I think I don't think I did a review on it. Uh, so we've got oh yeah, you've got quite a lot of. Um, Launch ramp here, that's quite impressive, isn't it? Look at that. It's got some presence, hasn't it? It's going to be quite big, isn't it? And it gives you um, paint guide for MIG, which I don't find particularly helpful. It's quite good at the bottom, though, uh, although they haven't printed it perhaps as light as they should have done. Yeah, it's quite hard to see, isn't it? Especially. So it shows a, a plan view and a you know, rear view and a front view. So it shows the, uh, how it should sit on the catapult uh, ramp. And on the other side, back a bit. On the other side we have got uh, basically a sprue guide and it says the V1 flying bomb, Vengeance weapon, also known as the buzz bomb to the Allies or the doodle bug, and in Germany is the cherry stone uh, or Kirschaken or my, my cafe, May bug was an early cruise missile production aircraft. First production aircraft to use a pulse jet for its power. Developed at Peenemunde, the Army Research Centre by the Nazi German Luftwaffe during the Second World War. Uh, and then it tells you all the things I just told you already, so we'll move on. So, oh, oh god, oh, not much of these instructions, okay. 
So basically, <laughs> this is going to be short. So basically, you've just got a top and a bottom uh, with the wings and the uh, elevators all complete. Then you attach your pulse jet on the top, and then you build up these sections. Uh, four times you build a section for the actual uh, ramp, and then you build the support, uh, the su sort of support stands, that, that put it up at an angle underneath, complete with like concrete bases as the feet. And then, then ah, this is good. So the, here we have actually got the uh, the steam ram, which is uh, the bit that a lot of people don't realise. They think this thing just flies off the th off the ramp by a pulse jet, but it doesn't. It doesn't have enough airspeed to get going. So it's it's this aircraft carrier style uh, steam powered ram, which attaches like a dolly almost underneath uh, the V1 and. It's a big tube up in the middle, and it whoosh, and it gives it that very quick acceleration airspeed to get it going. And the pulse jet then obviously has the performance to keep it keep it going. And at the end here, uh, all the scrubbings you you make up here. It's not the clearest instructions, I've got to say. I'm mm, I'm a bit. I don't think the instructions are great. I've got to be honest. I don't think this is. Uh, I, I don't know what it is with China. Uh, somebody said in one of my other reviews it may have been the Lancaster. And I agreed with him actually. He said, "You're right about the bad instructions, but it's better than Chinglish." <laughs> uh, obviously, obviously, he's probably had some of this uh, AFV club type stuff, which I've moaned about in the past, where it's incomprehensible gibberish, like the Royal Army and the British Army stuff like that, <laughs> and bad bad spelling and unfathomable instructions. And he said, perhaps it's better to have no instru no written words, just good diagrams which we did get on the Lancaster but when we ran into trouble with that kit was the turrets because they have three turrets one two three one two three yeah uh, gun turrets and it didn't make it clear in the instructions which was which so if you're not that familiar with Lancasters it could cause you quite a lot of problems anyway I have to say I'm a little bit I'm slightly disappointed with this I think it's too small for one thing it's very it's not that clearly printed if I'm honest anyway see what you think um, but certainly the way it's, it's not exactly uh, Zukimura in the clarity of its instructions, is it, where it shows you, you know, views from every angle and then a zoom view, no. Here it's very much, hope you've got a good eyesight and I hope you know where to put those, locate these bits, because it's not terribly clear. But we move on. Finally, you put your V1 on the ramp, which looks, I'm sure, very impressive by now. And that's it, really, so there's not much to it. Hmm. Yeah. Um, personally, I'm um, talking about Revel here, obviously with the V2. Revel do a good job now. Their, their instructions are nice and clear. They're one of the most improved of all the manufacturers, but that's a bit. It's too small. You know, it just has an arrow. It doesn't. It's not very specific where the arrow is supposed to go. But you know, let's have a look. We've got some nice decals. Now, interestingly. Very interesting. Um, we have got here lots of little German crosses. No swastikas, I have to say. Uh, I'm not even sure that it wore German crosses. Does it show that at the back? It shows German crosses on top of the wings. Well, I'm not convinced about that. Um, I'm sure there was lots of variations, so I don't want to be too, you know specific about who's right and who's wrong, but I'm not sure that they ever bothered with that because this was not not a machine that needed to be identified. It was a flying bomb. Uh, there was no friend or foe, you know, any of that stuff that you have on aircraft. So I'm not sure that I've seen that before. A bit unconvinced really about the markings. No, I'm not too sure about that. I mean, again, if we just flash back to my earlier uh, Tamiyar version, there's lots of uh, data and identification markings, but there's no crosses on this, is there? Nothing. Because it didn't need them. It didn't need to identify itself to anybody, it was just going to fly, do its thing and explode. So, a bit strange. Anyway, let's have a look at the plastic that comes in one bag. And that's okay, I suppose. There's not that many parts. I think most of it is all ramp. <coughs> now then, 
So we've got many, many multiples. So we just put some multiples to one side and look at one of them. Okay, so the ramp. Let's zoom you in properly for this. I'll tell you one thing, it's really heavy. This is very, there's a lot of mass here. That's a heavy sprue for a small one. Whoa, that's uh, surprising. So, yeah. Let's have a look and see what the plastic's like. Now, based on my experience of the V, uh, the V2 Spirit, uh, the moulding was very, very good. Uh, and I think we have the same again here, I'm glad to say. Um, maybe. There's a lot of ejector pins here, but that doesn't matter. This is the inside face. There's tons and tons of ejector pins, big ones along here. This is the inside, though, of the tube, so I don't think you're going to see it. This is the, uh, the plug, the uh, sliding steam uh, catapult plug that fixes underneath and uh, projects this tube, obviously projects up the ramp. Look very, very carefully there. You can see on the ends of these fins, can you see that? That they've got ejector pins in them as well. But again, it's, it's inward facing and that will be completely concealed, so we won't worry about that. This is the outside here. And it looks really good. I, say, I cannot stress how heavy this is. It's, it's like something of lead. <laughs> how odd. Um, quite a substantial bit of plastic to be honest. So, putting the ejector pins aside, which I don't think are an issue, if we're being honest. Look at the riveting that they've got here at the end of the, uh, the section of launch front. That's really nicely done, isn't it? Yeah, 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 that's, that's impressive. I like it actually. That's fine. Very good. Let's have a look at the uh, the other two sprues. Oh, you actually get two! You get two flying balls. There's two of these sprues as well. Oh my goodness, I didn't realise that. You actually get two flying bombs. There's a duplicate sprue, look. One, two. Excellent. That's a bonus. So, am I right in saying you get two ramps then? Because it makes four. Yes, it said to make four. Okay. It doesn't seem to be abundantly clear, but you get two of everything. So, you get two ramps and two flying bombs. Suddenly I'm a lot more happy. <laughs> Does it actually tell you that? Let's make four. Oh yes, two of four of these and two of these. And when it tells you, to, it doesn't make it clear, does it? It's the same problem I just alluded to. Nothing is explained. Yeah, this is a bit like the uh, Lancaster, isn't it? Uh, and that was, that was from Hong Kong model. Uh, I'm not trying to bitch or not manufacturers at all, but I think. There's a thing in these Chinese manufacturers, they're not making much effort. It's very basic to the point of incomprehensible instructions. Generally, I'm talking there, not this one. Please, you know, if you want to compete with Tamiar, you know, you're going to have to do better, quite frankly. Um, the one that gets closest, I suppose, is Great Wall Hobby, but they're no paragon of virtue either. They've got these instructions where it all falls apart and there's all different sheets. And then there's multiple amendments and corrections because they made mistakes. I don't think the Chinese are good at instructions and they need to to really get onto the level of someone like Tamiya in the future, which I don't think they will, by the way, but we'll see. But they need to put a lot more investment and energy into their instructions and they need to do research, show photos, explain things clearly, put some English in there, written by somebody from America or Australia or England or somewhere that speaks it. You know, it's just not very good. Um, not a deal breaker for, for experienced model makers like myself and most of you, I'm sure, but it's just a bit annoying, isn't it? Anyway, let's look at this prop. Okay, let's just. Uh, this is not heavy. This is quite the opposite. This is an ultra light sprue <laughs> for some reason. But let's have a close look. Okay, so, what have we got? We've got the underside of the bomb, and this is the top side. We've got various components including the uh, here you can see we've got the pulse jet itself here and it's uh, rudder and here we have the plug which is the the ram if you like uh, steam ram that powers it off the up the catapult up that tube we talked about so there's some nice molding here there's some nice molding I've got to say that's nice isn't it the uh, support uh, section that actually supports the ramp and there's a, another piece of it here um, that's kind of it I guess um, 
when you, then you've got these bits, this is what I wasn't very happy about in the instructions where you were looking at these pieces here and we were just trying to fathom exactly where they go and it wasn't very specific, uh, not the clearest. Maybe when you get into building it, it might become a bit clearer, we shall see. Uh, well, that's kind of it, I guess. So you just get two of those, as I say, so you get to build two flying bombs. Um, it's quite nice that they've got this sort of riveting detail, isn't it? You can see it there on the wings. It's, it's nice, you know. It's, it's also got like a vent pipe here, look at the back, see that? At the tail, which I've never seen. Does mine have that? Oh yes, it does. It's like, mm, well, not quite as specific. That's quite well moulded in fairness, for 70 second scale. I like it, I like it. Hmm, it's a bit flashy in places, I noticed. Has it this one? The other one, one of them has got, yeah, this one's got a fair bit of flash. Let's just have a look at that. Can you see that? Sorry, I'm uh, looking at the wrong one. See here? Oops, there. Not a problem, obviously, not a major problem. It's not, it's not evident, really, on many other parts, so don't we get too churlish about it, you know. It's nice though, it's a nice scale. So you're going to have, you're going to have your flying bomb here. And it's going to be sitting on your ramp like so, I can't really show it you, but you get the general gist, don't you? And it's going to, um, yeah. I, mean, I think once you've got all these parts together, oh, I said about flash, there is actually some more flash here, I've just spotted some more. A bit flashy on the end of the, the ramp pieces, but we won't get bogged down with that. So, um, I think as a subject, the fact that they've done it with this ramp is brilliant, really. I think that's uh, really nice. What sort of lets it down a little bit is the lack of clarity in the instructions, which really, this, especially this bit, self-explanatory here, but this, is, this gets a bit more vague, and it's the very bit that they should have zoomed in. They didn't need to show the entire ramp, did they? Why couldn't they just zoom in and show that in a bit more depth and detail, nicely, clearly diagram, but it's not. So that's a little bit annoying. Anyway. There we have it. Um, I think overall, what, what we say for this? Um, I think I'm going to give that 8 out of 10. I think it will build up nicely uh, once you've figured out how to put it together. Uh, perhaps I'm being harsh, but I just find it a bit annoying that, uh, you know, there's this thing in China, it's like they think they don't need to bother with instructions and uh, you'll figure it out, you know. Well, okay, this is relatively simple, this one. But we've seen lots of others with the same problem. It doesn't seem to matter how much the kit is. Lancaster was £100. And it was some of it was a little bit getting towards the unfathomable. Yeah? And as I say, Great Wall Hobby. They, some of theirs, they have a lot of mistakes. It's just not, they're just not putting the effort in. Kitty Hawk, of course, they're another one. I've sadly lost them. They've actually shut down their operation. But they're another one that's instructions were gibberish. Total gibberish, you know. This is where China is letting letting themselves down. They're producing the actual plastic really well. In most cases. I've mentioned Meng and the trike. <laughs> um, but they're doing good plastic, but they're just not doing the support. They're not, you know. So let's just summarise this. You know, you've got Tamiya with their new Phantom F4B, £100. It's a lot of money. But you've got that Lancaster, which is also £100 from Hong Kong model. Now it's bigger, but you open that Tamiya kit. Somebody said this to me, he was agreeing with me, he made a comment. I'm sorry, I can't remember your name just off the top of my head. But he, he commented last week and he said, yeah, uh, when I complained about the sprues having been quite crudely cut off, like a, a fuse lines this was. They were in a nice bag and they weren't on a sprue, but they'd clearly been cut off a master, probably a huge thing, and many, many fuselages on it. And it was a bit crude. And, he, and I said, I don't think you'd see this on a Tamiya. And he wrote a comment underneath and said, you're absolutely right, I've just got the Phantom. Nothing like that on this, you know. And it's the same price. Now, you can argue that you perhaps get a better value with the big Lancaster, I don't know. But as an experience, from a model's point of view, I don't think you do. Um, the, you know, these... These are nice subjects, and actually they've moulded that very well. I like the bomb itself, it looks really good. And I think the ramp will be good once it's finished as well. And I, I think I'm going to make this one for sure, because I think it's quite an interesting subject. And I like the vengeance weapon. I need to get around to doing my V2. You can tuck them into places, because they're not that big, you know. Uh, anyway, the point I was making was just that, you know, Tamiya get, tick every box. Uh, they weren't quite as uh, totally accomplished as Wing Nut Wings, but then again, they were probably doing it so well that they bankrupted themselves or certainly made 
insufficient profits and probably the reason that one of the reasons that they went out of business I think certainly a contributing factor because they were they were doing this to uh, levels of perfection we haven't seen Tamiya have got that knocks back slightly but gives everything you need gives a history some colour photos a, a guide to the real aircraft you know we haven't got any of that here we've got nothing just a few lines and some instructions which look like they were photocopied at prompt to print you know so I think my message to the Chinese manufacturers all of you is just you need to step it up you need to step it up if you really want to take on the likes of Tamiya uh, you'll have to change the way you're doing this and uh, Tamiya will remain the king I think uh, for a long time if you don't and okay forget Tamiya look at Revel there look at Airfix their instructions now are becoming really good very very clear okay Airfix don't give you all the historical data and uh, photographs and things like that but there's nothing wrong with their instructions and there's nothing wrong with the rebel instructions they're clear you've got to make more effort on the instructions guys anyway don't want to be negative I, I, I have to say I think it, this, this retail I think it was about 18 pounds uh, and I think for 18 pounds it's good value so 8 out of 10 only let down by its slightly iffy instructions a little bit of flash here and there um, I think we could have done with a bit more to come with it um, however as a kit I think it'll be brilliant and I think when you built it you'll think 18 quid that was quite a bargain so 8 out of 10 yes go and buy this one just turn a blind eye to the lack of supplementary data shall we say anyway hope you enjoyed the video found it interesting um, hope to get some more out to you in the not too distant future there's still one or two new releases that are interesting to come won't give away what they might be just yet um, but keep supporting the channel if you would please and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and if you have subscribed then don't forget to uh, give us a like give me more than 8 out of 10 with a thumbs up uh, and if you have subscribed and already given me a thumbs up then don't forget to ding the notification bell whereby you'll get early advance notice of any new ones that I'm uploading for you um, and don't don't hesitate to comment. We always like comments. And uh, on the Lancaster, I, I got a few comments. I made a mistake actually. I knew straight away when I'd finished the, the movie, but um, the video. Uh, I made a mistake about talking about the bombs. I kept, I kept calling it the Grand Slam bomb, a big cookie, the one that's like a, a canister. And I knew as soon as I watched, it, oh, it's, not, it's not the Grand Slam's the big one that looks like a missile. Anyway, of course, everybody pulled me up about it, which is which is fine. You know, I don't mind that at all. But I did I did actually tell people in the live chat. I said, I know what, no, 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 please, straight away I said, oh, nope, that's wrong, you know, I actually correct myself quite a lot, because I like to get it right, and sometimes you just don't, and especially when you're doing unedited, uninterrupted video like this, you're never going to get it right every time, if you're working off memory, you'll, you'll mumble up your words and mix things up, and you'll, it'll come out wrong once or twice, occasionally, so, sorry about that, <laughs> but don't hesitate to pull me up, and, and please comment, if you've built the kit, Please comment what your experiences were. That's the most interesting thing of all, really. I can't build all these kits, as I, I always say. But I think I might build this one. I think I'm going to enjoy that. Anyway, thanks very much for joining me. I uh, hope you all stay well. And until next time, thanks a lot. And bye for now.